You would have never thought he'd ask. Brown. Brown. Brown, you have a brown. Brown, He was offended when it first started happening. He was meeting you. Because he tried to teach her, they start laughing. And then he realized, what's going on here? And uh, then he realized God was birthing joy. Some of the most powerful treasure hunts we've had, we had laughing fits right before we prayed with people. Remember that time we were in my car with like gangsters? Yeah, the tin windows on the caddy, the shocks in the back for the bags. It was like, what's up? You gonna try to do the part? I don't think they're around the holiday, but I'm not sure either. And I think they did it for like three days or more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, after that, you know, when God's moving, um, you know, sometimes if, if you don't know, it can be like a, a little like, what's going on here? When we were in um, Florida, one of our good friends was laughing and crying for, hey, Renata, how long do you think that Ashley was, like, closer was doing something, like a good hour? Yeah, yes. And it was so funny because the people behind kept looking back at her, like, stop, you know, Holy Spirit's doing something, that's good. <laughs> So we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Last week I talked about having eternal vision so that when God tells you that he's going to do something, you need to keep your eyes on that promise. And the way that Abraham was able to believe for a child that took 25 years to come is he had a vision of a place that was in the future, a city built by God. And, uh, and to be heavenly minded. Well, we're going to take that a step further. And we're going to examine Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. How many of you guys have heard at least, I'll say, five messages on resurrection? Not many, huh? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the basis for being born again. Right? Because it says in Romans 10.9 that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess it with your mouth, you're born again. <laughs> you okay with Alice? You help me good? Oh. Oh. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I like being drunk in the like this. It's fun. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, the resurrection. So... <laughs> So the resurrection is the basis of Christianity, yet it's not talked about a lot. <laughs> and a lot of people will focus on, you know, the cross. The cross of Jesus is the power, right, of God for salvation. But if he was not resurrected from the dead, we would still be in sins. Without the resurrection from the dead, we would still be the old nature people. And so he had to be... <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> so if it wasn't the, if it wasn't for the resurrection, we'd be stuck in our old name. That's all I'm trying to get out. I'm sorry. <laughs> but then but then God took it and my golly faces. I'll lose it. You make the face of the So <laughs> Jesus gave bonds. <laughs> Jesus gave us a new nature in which we can have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. That was his intention from the very beginning was to give us the Holy Spirit. And what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so he now lives in us and when you realize the indwelling, remember Paul said, my gospel, I didn't come to you with wisdom, your know, wise words and, and persuasive words. He said, I came to you in the power of God. And then he said, the kingdom of God is not word only. It is the power. The gospel of Paul was the indwelling. That was his gospel. In fact, he said, God gave me this gospel personally. And then he developed it over 15 years before he was released 
uh, the apostles in Jerusalem as a, a legitimate you know, person. But he had been ministering in Damascus. He had been ministering in all of those areas for 15 years. And then he went to Jerusalem and said, this is the gospel God has given me. The former persecutor of the Christians. And, and they said, yes, you are definitely born again. We bless your work. Go forth. And he ended up at Antioch. His message is Christ in you. The expectation of the glory of God. Why? Because the resurrection power lives on the inside of you. So when you have uh, uh, sermons that are centered around the cross only, or when you have sermons centered around how you're still a sinner but you're saved by grace, when that happens, it um, neutralizes resurrection power. Because you have to understand that the same Jesus Christ that walked on the planet lives in you in bodily form in the power and the person of Holy Ghost. So you're no longer a sinner saved by grace. You are a saint. And Jesus did not come to be a model for you. He came to be a model of who you are right now. So the more that your soul comes into agreement with this reality, the more you walk in resurrection power. And it's not just resurrection power to raise the dead, which we need to get to that place. But what it is is character. What if more Christians relied on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to be as Jesus was on the earth instead of everything else that they're asking for? What if we access the anointing to be transformed in our soul into Jesus Christ? John, he said, I'm not telling you the, these things so that you sin. I'm telling you, telling you these things so you don't sin. Now you go up to most leaders and say, do you know the Bible says that I don't have to sin? They will think you've lost your mind. <laughs> Won't they? Oh no, we all sin. That's, that's what they tell you. And then John says, but if you do, not when you do, if you sin, you have an advocate. You have a lawyer. He stands to your defense. Oh, I already paid for that body. That's what he does. I already paid for that. It's good. And then, not only that, the blood cleanses you from all iniquity, unrighteousness, that bend toward that sin. It is the power of God that delivers you from your old way of thinking. And here's another thing I think is worth reminding. You do not have two natures living on the inside of you. That is not how that works. You have one nature, Jesus Christ, but you have a soul that has been trained in the ways of the world that you must retrain with the Word of God so that you can come into agreement with the reality that is on the inside of you. You are not warring against your flesh. You are not warring against your old nature. It is dead and buried. You have been resurrected with Jesus Christ. Your life is now hidden in Him, and so you're not having this fight. It's simply sometimes your soul is like, whoa, whoa. No, I don't think we need to go that far. You know what I mean? That, that's what it does. Or an old way of thinking rears itself up, but it is not your old nature. Romans 6 says, Reckon, consider yourselves dead. Right? And do not allow sin to have dominion over you. The way sin has dominion is areas of untrained soul. That's what it does. Old ways of thinking, old patterns of behavior, old patterns of sin. And so the enemy is crafty. He, he forms these methods and he comes and he arranges circumstances in your life to trigger you. And a lot of times he knows you better than you know yourself. Right? So he comes and he, like someone can say something and then, you know, you react a certain way and then before you know it, it's like, you know, and all this stuff has been said. I was seeing some stuff and my hair was orange today. I'm just going to be honest. You know, you don't put a, 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 a lady's hair and she'll be orange. Because you know, there's, there's just something wrong with that. Right? I mean, if you want orange, that's fine, man. I don't want orange. <laughs> so, we just need glitter for your hair. <laughs> whatever. Whatever. I want glitter either. And so, here's the thing. If you realize that that old nature is completely dead, when the enemy comes knocking to try to get you to do something, you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. The Lord, when, when he was about to die, he said, I'm not going to talk to you too much longer because the evil one is coming, but he has nothing in me. That's where you need to get. 
That's where he wants to get you. And, you know, one of the, the quickest ways that he gets Christians into sin is holding offense. It's a trap. It's a bait. We, we repeatedly stick our hand in the trap and it ensnares us. And it begins to destroy relationships and it destroys churches and it destroys marriages. It destroys all kinds of stuff because people get offended. I have seen people literally go insane, Hanji, from unforgiveness. Literally insane. A accomplished, a businesswoman, awards and rewards and all kinds of stuff. And then she refuses to forgive. She now walks around, if she's still alive, I don't know, walks around with fake babies and spray bottles to keep demons away. Spray bottles of water. And then, when you talk to her and you say, you need to forgive, clarity comes over her and she goes, no, I'm, I'm never going to forgive. Unforgiveness is a choice. I don't care how insane you are. You know. You know. So we don't understand. We just need to be training. There's nothing wrong with you whenever you're fighting for something. You don't need to feel bad. What you need to do is like, all right, this is obviously an area where I've not retrained it yet, right? Get you some scripture. Get you some word. Dig around. Whatever area you're needing an answer in, you need to get the word and find out what belongs to you. You have to do that. And so that resurrection power is on the inside of you for transformation. And then, the more refined, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Renew your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Renew your mind so that you know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, it's growth. At first you know what's good, right? And then you're like, okay, that's acceptable. But then you get to the perfect. Then there's no more, well, I don't know, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. God's not schizophrenic. It's one way or another, right? So as you grow and your mind is renewed, then all of a sudden clarity comes. Clarity. And then you're a mature son and daughter of the Lord because you're led of the Holy Spirit and you're confident. But at first there's going to be back and forth because your soul is warring against what God is telling you. Your soul rebels at faith because the soul does not understand faith. The soul understands reasoning and trying to figure things out. That's what it specializes in. So when you start, you know, getting that mind going, you're starting to try to figure things out, just stop. Just stop. You're wasting your time. You cannot figure out faith. Faith demands action. That's all it is. Okay? And then if you're not sure that you're hearing God, find trusted people. Find trusted people. You know, I'm getting this, I'm not sure. Like, very honest, she'll call me. You know, I'm thinking this, but I'm not sure. What do you think? We'll have a quick discussion. Same thing with Elizabeth. But here's the thing. Here's the deal. A lot of us, whenever we're hearing something and we're not sure, we actually know. You know what I mean? It's deep down. Sometimes you just need someone to say, what's deep down? What are you feeling in your gut? Right? That was for somebody. Praise God. That's good. Man, I like it. All right. So let's look at this. Let's look this resurrection power that Abraham saw before Jesus even came. The enemy has stolen that revelation from us. He's stolen it. He's focused on the cross and the grave, but he ain't there. He's not in the grave. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Right? He is an unapproachable light. That's what he's in. We no longer know him after the flesh. That's what, that's what Paul said. We no longer know him. But Jesus of Nazareth, we no longer know him that way. You can learn how he lived because that's you. But he is the God of the universe. Now, he has regained all his heavenly and godly deity. He got it all back. Okay? So when he talks, when he moves, when he does anything, all of heaven moves. Okay? That's who we serve. Jesus the Christ. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father. That's what he's called. Everlasting Father. And Abraham saw it. Well, let me read Hebrews first. I was about to flip over to Genesis. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises 
offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Get this. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. There could have been any resurrections from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You know, one of the things, have you ever, like, has anybody ever planted seeds and stuff, trying to grow gardens and all that stuff? I've tried. That's my opinion. No, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a green thumb, man. It's like black. <clears throat> when you plant an apple seed, I know this is a stupid question, what kind of tree do you get? You just look at you gotten something different. When you plant an avocado seed, what do you get? Who is the seed in you? Jesus. What do you get? Jesus. You don't get the old nature. You don't get the sinful nature. You get Jesus Christ, people. That's how it works. He didn't make no mistake. When he puts Jesus in you, that is what is formed. And that's why Jesus said, you'll know him by the fruits. Because if I'm planting in them, they're going to start looking more and more like me. If I'm not planting in them, and they're acting like the devil, guess what? They don't have the seed. They're still of their father, the devil. The Bible says that right now in Malachi, let me just read this to you real quick before we get to, because um, we're just going to go with the flow of the Holy Ghost, right? There's no sense in trying to resist him and follow notes and stuff. We're just going to do what he wants to do. And, uh, Malachi 3. <laughs> what? Someone take that? I missed it. Oh, those of you can't get up. Just don't even try. Just lay there. Why are you getting up? Put that down. Alright. It says 3, 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard. Every time you speak of God, He hears you. Then what He does? Angels, bring my book. And the Lord listened and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Why his name? Because all that he is is in that name. His character, his authority, his reputation. If you met someone and they have a good name, then you know that you can count on them. And it's by their name, right? So then it says, They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare him as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you will again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. That's going to be made really plain. Right now, it's not real plain. But it's going to get very plain. In fact, in Revelation, God says, if you're going to be wicked, be wicked all the way. If you're going to be righteous, be righteous all the way. There is no setting on a fence. There is not one foot in and one foot out. You're either in or out. That's it, right? Okay. So you have areas that need renewal. Your heart is loyal to Him. You know, there's, there's things that you're working on. That's different from those who try to play a little bit, you know, around with some things, get away with some things, and then show up Sunday at church. And like I said last, uh, last week, we're going to start people, seeing people drop dead because of that. Because when the glory of God comes, guys, when He starts hitting churches like He's doing, you can't play around with that. The scariest I've ever been was when I was leading a Bible study, and I'm, and I'm sitting there before anybody gets here, and I'm just going over my notes, and all of a sudden it smelled like smoke. It was down in a basement, and it smelled like smoke. So I'm looking around trying to find where, where the fire is. So I go into the kitchen, and I'm, and I'm walking around, can't find any fire. I sit back down, and then I realize the smoke also had like an incense smell. And so all of a sudden it hit me. So then I'm frozen. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do because the fear of God came into the place. So I get up. I'm still by myself. I get I tiptoe to the bathroom. I hide myself in the stall. And I said, Lord, help me not say one word that would displease you. Because I knew the way he was manifesting I don't believe now in lightning bolts just randomly coming down and hitting people like I used to when I was first born again. But I will tell you in that moment, I knew not to say one word that would displease him. 
And so we're going to start seeing that. We're going to start seeing that move through his church. Because, guys, how would you like it if you raise up your child just right and then people come in and say the one thing and corrupt that child? What do you do? You handle business, right? One time, this, the, the one time Kent messed up his whole life, I told him, I said, that one dude that's coming around, that adult, and he's giving you kids stuff, I will have him arrested. I will do it if I ever see his face again. Well, Mom, doesn't he need to be born again? Not by my hand. He can go somewhere else and get born again. If I see him around here, I will have him arrested. That's how the Lord is. How do you think he feels that baby Christians come into a church, right? And, and, and they're excited and they're happy and they want to learn about God and they look up to people that have been there for a long time and then they find out those people are doing drugs. You think God doesn't see that? Ecclesiastes says that the heart of men grows more wicked as judgment is delayed. People think that judgment, you know, if it doesn't come, they can keep getting away with it, right? No. It's, it's a cup. Remember when the Lord, He told uh, Abraham, He said, your descendants are going to be slaves. Okay? They're going to be slaves in the land, but I'm going to free them when the cup of iniquity is full for the Amorites. And once that cup got full, those people that were slaves became His judgment. That's what happened. So here we have, I don't know how I got on that. My goodness. My goodness, what is going on? I'm going to try again to get to <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad. Praise God. See, that's the thing with the prophetic anointing. A prophet's not someone that gives sweet little words to people. A prophet is one that when they preach the word of God, it goes into the heart of the matter so much so that you feel like you're targeted. It's just another day. Right, can I tell you a story? Lulu, she goes, I was so mad in worship last week. I'm like, why? And she said, I was offended. And I said, why? She goes, because you went against food addictions. I'm like, so? Well, I thought you were targeting me. I'm like, oh my gosh, how many times have I been telling you I don't target people? You know what I mean? And she goes, yeah, I figured that way. Don't let it go. I said, yeah. <laughs> my goodness. That's how the prophetic works. All right. So, this is a faith Abraham uh, had. I'm going to do a quick recap. Abraham and Sarah could not have kids. Genesis 15, God promised them a son. A pre flesh form of Jesus Christ with two angels just kind of had a pit stop to have dinner with Abraham on their way to investigate Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And he told Abraham, you're going to conceive during the season. You know. And so Sarah's like, ha, 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 laughs within herself. She's like, what are you doing? Why is she laughing? You know. And so then, 25 years later, Isaac is born. All right, so that's where we're at. Now, we're going to look at Genesis 22, verse 1. <laughs> Praise God. I love his word. All right, I feel funky tonight. I think my orange hair is setting me off. Now, it came to pass after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Yo. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> then he said, Take out your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. You know the Lord really stresses things to you when it's time for that, you know, uh, final exam. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't put it off. Right? He got up early to go kill his kid. I would have been dragging. You know what I mean? I would have been putting it off. Sat on his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad or young man, they think he was probably in his twenties, maybe thirty. He was not a teenager, more than likely. The young man and I will go yonder and worship. We'll come back to you. That was his confession. We will come back to you. We. Do you think Sherry was from Texas? He might have been. I like the word yonder. Yep. <laughs> That's why I didn't talk about 
So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. Who does that remind you of? Jesus carrying his cross. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. And Isaac's like, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, look, we got the fire, we got the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, well, you're it. He said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there. He placed the wood in order. And then he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Isaac opened his mouth. It's quiet. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Not a lamb, but a ram. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. As it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And then the angel of the Lord gives him that promise again. The angel of the Lord was a pre-flesh form of Jesus Christ that he'd already had dinner with that promised him his son. Once you get one miracle, guys, you're ready for the next. That's how it works. Okay? Once you see it once, you're ready for the next. When the enemy comes to you and says you're going to lose something, you're like, no, he already gave it to me. It's mine. When God tests you, says, I want you to give that up. Yes, Lord. And it just gets you ready for the next one. That's how it works. That's how it works. The enemy will make you think that God is taking from you, right? But you cannot grab hold of the new if you're still hanging on to what's behind it. You have to let it go. He said, no one's worthy to follow me if they're hand and they're looking back at the plow. Have you ever tried to plow and you're looking back? My goodness. When well, Mike, when we go somewhere, when Mike looks this way, he goes this way. <laughs> That's how he is. You're, you cannot see the promise and the miracle that you need if you're looking back at what you had to let go. So just let it go. Right? So that's what happens. I want to give you the prophetic. This is incredible. The reason Abraham could obey so promptly is because God had already given him a son as a miracle. Now, he said, take down your son, your only son, whom you love. That is the exact phrase in Aramaic Hebrew. Whichever one, where it says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the exact same word. Abraham went to the exact place where the temple was later built. That's where he went. That's the Mount of the Lord. Zion. On the third day. Right? He was resurrected on the third day. Then in verse 8, he says, God's going to provide himself a lamb. He, Jesus called the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Abraham was figuratively living out a parable of the coming of the Son of God who gave himself as the burnt offering. That's what he was doing. If you don't understand sometimes why God has you do stuff, don't worry about it. Don't lean upon your own understanding. Right? Just do it. How do you know you're not living something out prophetically that another person needs to see? And you're going to feel weird doing it. That's weird tying up your son. And then the other thing, he didn't open his mouth. Isaac didn't say a word. Just like Jesus. He didn't open his mouth at all. And Isaiah 53, 10, and this is going to blow you guys away. you got to hear what's being said. It says, it pleased the Father to bruise him. It pleased the Father to bruise his son. Why do you think it pleased him? Have you ever thought about it? Because he loves us. For you, and you, and you, and you. You guys meant more and mean more to him than himself. So he was willing to do all of that 
because of his great love for us. So it pleased the Father. He breathed on Jesus said, no greater love has anyone in this to lay down his life for his friends. And then notice how he phrased it. Abraham was prophesying, in the mount of the Lord, it, or the offering, the lamb, will be provided. He was saying that the future love of God that was coming will be provided on this very mountain. That's what he was saying. Abraham. How can he have such faith and eternal vision to do that? He knew human sacrifice was not God's will. He came from a pagan culture. He knew that. It says, let's look back, Hebrews 11, 19. First it says he did it by faith. But then listen to this. Concluding, coming to a reasoned conclusion that was reasoned out in faith. That's what that means. That God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The word figurative literally means parable. Okay, so he was carrying it out as a parable. But he had faith in the resurrection before there was ever a resurrection. He, had, he knew it. Why? Because God said, I'm going to give you a son. God does not give you a promise to take away. That's not how he works. So he knew that all of the promises of God to him were dependent on this child. He warred with his prophetic word. That's what he did. He's like, you know, God promised me this son, me and Sarah are way past childbearing age, not, not to mention there was barrenness. So if he's telling me to do this, he has his reasons, and he'll raise them from the dead because he promised me. How is it that Abraham could walk and more faith than many of us. Yes. We have the Word of God. We've got the Scriptures. We have the Spirit of faith living on the inside of us. We have Jesus Christ. Why does Abraham operate in more faith than we do? Oh, Jesus. Doubt and unbelief clouds your vision. It causes you not to believe the promises of God. Wherever you have doubt and belief, you believe a lie. You have to go back. What's the lie? And God will he'll, he'll have you do hard things. He'll tell you, you gotta let it go. You gotta let that person go. You gotta let that job go. You gotta let that friendship go. You gotta let something go. But what do we do? We hang on it so tight that he can't do what he needs to do. We enable people to stay where they're at. We enable people to be messed up because we're not willing to let it go. Well, why do you think that your love for our people is greater than His? Do you think that they're going to be saved when you enable them? We cannot do that anymore. If you really love a person, you really love a relationship. Guys, I'm serious. I feel the anointing all over this. Get your hands off. Get them off. You know what I mean? Get them off. If the Holy Spirit is telling you to back up, the worst thing you can do is keep meddling. Because He will not go against your will. So back off. Because you're not Holy Spirit. And you don't have the wisdom that God has to bring about what is needed in that person's life. I want to make my decision. Nothing testifies to that. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yes. You have to let them go. Yeah. Believe in the power of the resurrection. If you let them go, God is more than able to raise them up. They show up. You don't see Jesus chasing after people. He didn't chase after his family. We've got this unsanctified mercy. Sometimes you've got people just need to walk off. Right? Just walk off. He's ministering. His family comes to him. 
Jesus, your mom's outside. She wants to talk to you. Right? He goes, who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And so those that do the will of God. He wasn't going to allow his family to derail them. You know why they were there? They thought he was nuts. They thought he was insane. And they were there to take him home. So you know what? You know what was mercy? Let's, let's picture it this way. If he would have done what most of us would have done, he would have gone out there to talk to his mom, right? And you know what would have happened? An argument. An argument would have occurred. So in his mercy, he didn't go mess with that. He stayed focused. And he knew that God would take care of them. And God did. She would, Mary was in the room of the 120. Got spirit filled. His brother, James, became the apostle of the church in Jerusalem. His brothers did not believe until he was born or until he was raised from the dead. They did not believe in him. So what if you would have been every Sunday preaching sermons out? It would have done nothing. It would have done nothing at all because this is our you know, brother. Often, family is the worst enemy of what God is trying to do. And so we just need to get out of the way and let God do what he needs to do. And sometimes, you know what that means? You know how everybody thinks it's such a sweet picture, the little lamb on Jesus' shoulders? Aww. That's so Actually, what happened is that lamb kept rebelling, going into the places where it's put him in danger. So the shepherd came and broke its back legs. That's what they did. Then put it around the shoulders because it couldn't walk. And so while he's carrying the lamb, it gets so used to the presence of the shepherd that whenever the, the, the lamb is healed, it stays right by him. It's the closest one. That's how that works. Never strays again. Ever. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? Sometimes the legs have to be broken. But if they're the safety of the, the, the flock, right? It's not going to happen. He said, I'll leave the 99. And I'll go after that one. He didn't tell us to follow him and go. Pray. He said, okay, guys, y'all come with me. That's not how that worked. He said, I'll do it. Y'all stay where you're at in the safety of the flock. Intercede and pray. Do as I tell you to do. And I will go handle this one. That's how that works. Man. Huh. Praise God. I make my name. Put some hard fish on me. <laughs> Be proud. This is not my notes. <laughs> I remember when me and Mike, we first got married. I was young, tried to change my man. Huh? But you're glad I don't like that anymore. I'm glad I don't like that anymore. One day, I've been working so hard to get him to do what I wanted him to do. Just wasn't working. And uh, it was another time I felt the fear of God come on me. He said, you are not the Holy Spirit. That's all I had to say. Okay. <laughs> and I had to learn, you know. So I got quieter. But, you know, I still wanted to be different. And why do we do that? We marry because we like each other. And we get married and it's like, I don't want them like that anymore. That's right. So, I finally was exasperated. So I sit down on my bed. Lord, that man. Wish you'd change him. The Holy Spirit goes, well, you're not that easy to live with either. <laughs> I was like, hey, you talking about me. But you know what? That broke it. That broke it off of me. You know? And so, anyway, I'm going to try to move on. I'm going to try to move on. All right. Let's read verse 20 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Let's go back and see how this story really went down. 
Look at Genesis 27. This is our family thing, and this is a family focus. You know what happens when we're just trying to make people be what they, and you know, we don't have bad motives. You know what I mean? We don't have bad motives. We want the best for people. We want them to be successful. We want them to be free. But sometimes when you want something more than another person wants, it gets into control. It gets into manipulation. Okay? You cannot want people to be what you want them to be and at work. It has to be God. It has to be Holy Spirit. And so here we've got in Genesis 27. Now, Esau, you guys have heard of Esau. Love the world more than you love the promises of God, right? Uh, Jacob, I'm so hungry. I might die if I don't get something to eat. Yeah, it's like, I didn't catch anything. Because he's a hunter, right? Jacob's like, tell you what. I'll make you some food if you give me your birthday. So as dramatic as worldly people sometimes be, oh, what is the inheritance to me if I don't live? Because I'm starving to death. Is what he says. Okay, legal transaction. God says, Jacob I love, Esau I hate him. God saying he hates somebody? Why? Because Esau showed contempt for the, the inheritance, for a bowl of stew. Now I'm going to show you why that is so important in a minute. So that happens. Fast forward, Jacob is about to die. And he's blind. He's almost blind. And, uh, and so he called his son. He knew he was about to go. And he said, Esau, can you go hunting and make me some of that savory stew? Because Jacob and Esau, they were close, and Rebekah and Jacob, you know, or Isaac and uh, Esau were close, and Jacob and Rebekah were close. And he's like, sure, Dad. Like, and when you come back, I'll bless you. But pass it on. It's going to become yours. Okay. Goes off. Rebekah's like, shh. Jacob, come over here. That plan. Mama's boy. Gets them all dressed up because Esau was hairy. You know, and covered with fur. And uh, so he gets in the skins, he puts it on them. He said, I want you to go in there, bring in this stew, because you know how to cook it, right? Like Esau did. Bring in this stew and get the blessing before your brother gets back. Uh, I'm not sure this is such a good idea. <laughs> no, do it, do it, do it. Okay, so it goes in there. Jacob's like, man, that was quick. Here, let me touch you. Because he didn't trust that Jacob and Rebecca were up to something, right? So he touches him, he feels the fur. Okay, well, it must be Esau. Here, give me a hug or a kiss. Well, that smells like Esau. So he, he eats his stew. And this is what it says in verse 30. Not happened. No, he blesses him, right? And then verse 30, not happened. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had barely left the tent and gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in. He made savory food. He brought it to his brother, and he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, so that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said, Who are you? And he said, well, I'm your son, your firstborn, Isaac. Then Jacob started trembling, because he realized what just happened. It says, trembled exceedingly. And said, Who? Where is the one that hunted the game and brought it to me? I ate of all of it before you came, and I've blessed him, and indeed, he will be blessed. And when Esau heard these words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said, Bless me also, O oh my father. And he said, Your brother came with his seed and he's taken it away. It says that Isaac blessed him by faith. Do you see how much that blessing meant? It wasn't just a bunch of nice words that a father was going to speak over his son before he died. It was the promise of the Messiah. That's what he was passing on. The very promise that God gave Abraham and said, In you the nations will be blessed. I will bless you. I will multiply you. Anyone that messes with you, I will curse. That blessing passed to Esau, or supposed to, plus most of his possessions. Instead, Jacob got it. Why? Because God saw the contempt that Esau had for it. Even though he maybe didn't like the way he got it, he got it. Because he wanted what God uh, wanted for the family. So when Esau gave his birthright up for a bowl of soup, he was in essence saying, I give up the line and the lineage and everything that goes with the Messiah coming from us. 
Why? He didn't have eternal vision. He didn't have resurrection vision. And so he just, it meant nothing. And yet even, I think it's like Hebrews, it might say that even with great tears, when he tried to get the blessing, he couldn't get it because it was already taken. In Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you, of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, like that one, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We got the promise. It's passed down to us through Jesus Christ. We're the seed. The same ancient blessing that Jacob received from his dad, we now possess. And we begin to walk in it in fullness as our soul begins to understand what exactly has been given. And you know one of the things that, and I, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but one of the things that was the promise as well was uh, Holy Spirit. So when Esau would rather have a bowl of food instead of the promise, he was rejecting Holy Spirit. Paul said that. The blessing that was made to Abraham, the Holy Spirit. And how many, every day, every day we pick something other than Holy Ghost. Right? And then, Genesis 49 is really good. He, he prophesied to every single son. And do you know what happened exactly? For example, Benjamin. He said, you're a ravenous wolf. Right? But he also said he'd be strong in uh, war. What happens? Homosexuality runs rampant through the tribe of Benjamin. A man's traveling through the country. And the guy said, no, 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 you cannot travel after night. Here, come into my home. Let me protect you and your concubine, blah, blah, blah. He's like, okay. Men knocking on the door. We want him. We want to have sex with him. He's like, don't do this. Don't do this. Go home. They wouldn't let him alone. So he gives his concubine. Yeah. They rape him to death. She makes it back to the door, cut her in 12 pieces, and distribute her throughout the tribes. Judah, the warrior tribe, and everybody else, they go to Benjamin and they said, what you did was wrong. Give us the offenders. We're not giving you nothing. Ravenous wolf. They go into battle and kept losing. Could not defeat Benjamin. Finally, God gave them the strategy. They killed so many Benjamites that when they stopped killing them, they looked around and like, oh my gosh, we've almost wiped out the entire tribe. I think like 6,000 men were left. What are we going to do? Because we made an oath they wouldn't have our daughters. So they had to go get... I mean, it's a weird story, guys. Fast forward. Saul is on the scene. He's like, why are you picking me to be king? I'm of the least of the tribes. I'm of, I'm of Benjamin. He didn't have humility. He had insecurity. There's a big difference. People that are insecure, when they get a little bit of power, it goes to their head. Right? People that are humble... They get some authority and power. They know who's doing it. It's Holy Ghost. It has nothing to do with them. And they're humble. But they sound arrogant because they brag about God. Right? So, let's fast forward. Last person. We've got Joseph. Incredible man. Incredible. You know, people say that he was prideful. You know what? I would say he was probably a youth that needed some wisdom. But you can't tell me a man's prideful that forgave and forgave and forgave and followed God when he was falsely accused, his boss's wife was trying to rape him, gets thrown in prison unjustly. You know what I mean? That's not pride. That's a humble man. Okay? All of that happens. Joseph becomes second command of the most powerful nation on the earth. Then it says in verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of his departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Isn't that weird? He's like, okay, when God does what he told our father Abraham, 
because he believed. I want you to make sure you take me out. And this can get a little weird, okay? But follow me. Is make sure you take my bones out. Why? Well, he believed the promises of God, and he wanted to make sure that his bones were in the land of Canaan, but it gets even better than that. In Genesis 50, let's just read it real quick. Genesis chapter 50, and then we're going to go to Matthew 27. Genesis 50, 24 through 26. This is how it ends. This is how the book of Genesis ends. Actually, let's start with verse 22. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. And he saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, the children of somebody, the son of Manasseh, who were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I'm dying. Do you notice that they all knew when they were dying? Disease didn't take them randomly. They didn't have chariot wrecks or anything like that. They knew they were going to die. But God will surely visit you. When he visits you, he brings freedom. Make it and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. For, well, about three, no, about 400 years later, they get his body. They bring it out. Why? I mean, if you believe the promises, you might have even taught me this, G. I'm not sure. He believed the promises. But what does it matter if his bones go to the promised land? He's dead. He's a mummy. That's what embalming means. He's a mummy. Do you know the word embalmer is physician? <laughs> so if you wonder what physicians do today, they embalm you with a whole bunch of chemicals. But anyway, so they embalm. Why, why does he care if his bones are taken there? Any, any thoughts? The resurrection. He knew the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world was coming and there was going to be a resurrection and he didn't want to miss it. He didn't want to be in Egypt. He wanted to be in the land. Let me give you proof. Matthew 27. This is weird, guys. This is tricky. Matthew 27, verse 50. Listen to this. I never saw this in this way before. And Jesus cried out, with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Yielded. He gave. Then behold, the veil.